Section 14, chapters 43 and 44 of The Three Sisters by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 43. As Rowcliffe went back to his surgery, he recalled two things he had forgotten. One was a little gray figure he had seen once or twice, lately wandering through the fields about Upthorne Farm. The other was a certain interview he had had with Alice when she had come to ask him to get Greatorex to sing. That was in November, not long before the concert. He remembered the suggestion he had then made that Alice should turn her attention to reclaiming Greatorex. And though he had no morbid sense of responsibility in the matter, it struck him with something like compunction that he had put Greatorex into Alice's head chiefly to distract her from throwing herself at his. And then he had gone and forgotten all about it. He told himself now that he had been a fool not to think of it, and if he was a fool what was to be said of the vicar, under whose nose this singular form of choir practice had been going on for goodness knew how long. It did not occur to the doctor that if his surgery day had been a Friday, which was choir practice day, he would have been certain to have thought of it. Neither was he aware that what he had observed this evening was only the unforeseen result of a perfectly innocent parochial arrangement it had begun at christmas and again at easter when it was understood that greatorex who was nervous about his voice should turn up for practice ten minutes before the rest of the choir to try over his part in an anthem or cantata so that as alice said he might do himself justice since easter the ten minutes had grown to fifteen or even twenty and twice in the last three weeks greatorex by collusion with alice had arrived a whole hour before his time still there was nothing in this circumstance itself to alarm the vicar choir practice was choir practice a mysterious thing he never interfered with knowing himself to be unmusical rowcliffe had had good reason for refusing to urge greatorex to marry essie gale but what he had seen in garth church made him determined to say something to greatorex after all he went on his northerly round the very next sunday and timed it so that he overtook his man on his way home from church he gave greatorex a lift with the result which he had calculated that greatorex gave him dinner as he had done once or twice before the after-dinner pipe made jim peculiarly approachable and rowcliffe approached him suddenly and directly i say greatorex why don't you marry not a bad thing for you you know ay so they tell me said greatorex amicably rowcliffe went on to advise his marrying essie not on the grounds of morality or of justice to the girl he was a tactful person but on greatorex's account as the best thing greatorex could do for himself you mean said greatorex i ought to marry her rowcliffe said no he wasn't going into that greatorex was profoundly thoughtful presently he said that he would speak to essie he spoke to her that afternoon in the cottage down by the beck essie sat by the hearth nursing her baby he had recovered from his ailment and lay in her lap gurgling and squinting at the fire he wore the robe that mrs gale had brought to essie five months ago essie had turned it up above his knees and smiling softly he watched his little pink feet curling and uncurling as she held them to the fire essie's back and the back of the baby's head were toward the door which stood open the day being still warm greatorex stood there a moment looking at them before he tapped on the door he felt no tenderness for either of them only a sullen pity that was half resentment as if she had heard his footsteps and known them essie spoke without looking round you can come in if you want she said thank you he said stiffly and came in i can't get up with the baby but there's a chair somewhere he found it and sat down are you wondering why i've come essie no jim i wasn't wondering about you at all her voice was sweet and placable she followed the direction of his eyes he's better if that's what you've come for it isn't what i've come for i've something to say to you essie there's not much good you're saying anything jim i know all you have to say you'll have to hear it essie whether you know it or not they're telling me i ought to marry you essie's eyes flashed who's telling you the vicar for one the vicar he's a nice one to talk of marrying when his own wife can't live with him nor his own daughter neither and who else told you twasn't mother no twasn't your mother and 
"'Twasn't me, Jim, and never will be. "'Twas Dr. Rawcliffe. "'He? He's another. Who's he married? Miss Gwenda? Not he. "'Let the doctor be, Essie. He's right enough. "'So I ought to marry you, but I'm not going to. "'Have you come to tell me that? "'As if I didn't know it. "'Have I ever asked you to marry me? "'How, Essie? "'You can ask me. You'll be safe enough. "'For I won't have you.' Once I might have been mad enough, I might have said yes to you. But I'd say no today. At that he smiled. You wouldn't have a good-for-nothing fellow like me, would you, lass? It's not that I couldn't have married you. I could have married you right enough. And it's not that I don't think you're pretty. You're pretty enough for me. It's... It's... I can't rightly tell what it is. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. He looked hard at her. I might marry you yet, he said. But you know you wouldn't be happy with me. I should be cruel to you. Not because I wanted to be cruel, but because I couldn't help myself. There'd be something else I should be thinking on and wanting all the while. I know, I know. I wouldn't let you, Jim. I wouldn't let you. I know there's the baby and all. It's hard on you, Essie. But I don't know. I would be cruel to the baby, too. Then she looked up at him, but with more incredulity than reproach. You wouldn't, she said. You couldn't be cruel to little Jimmy. He scowled. You've called him that, Essie? And why shouldn't I call him? He's a right to that name anyhow. You cannot take that away from him. I don't want to take it away from him. I wish you hadn't. I wish you hadn't, Essie. Why, half the lads in the village is called Jimmy. You're called Jimmy yourself, come to that. He considered it. Well, it's not as if they didn't know, all of them. Oh, they knows. Do you mind them, Essie? They don't make you feel bad about it, do they? She shook her head and smiled her dreamy smile. He rose and looked down at her with his grieved, resentful eyes. You mustn't suppose I don't feel bad, Essie. I've laid awake many a night thinking what I've done to you. What have you done, Jimmy? You made me happy for six months. And there's the baby. I didn't want him before he comes. Seemed like I'd have to have him instead of you. But you can go right away, Jimmy, and I shouldn't care if I never saw you again, so long as I had him. Is that truth, Essie? It's God's truth. He put out his hand and caressed the child's downy head, as if it was the head of some young animal. I wish I could do more for him, Essie. I will, maybe, some day. I wouldn't let you. Wouldn't touch your money now if I could go out to work and look after him, too. Wouldn't touch a penny of it. I wouldn't. Don't you say that, Essie. You don't want to spite me, do you? I didn't say it to spite you, Jimmy. I said it so's you shouldn't feel so bad. He smiled mournfully. Poor Essie, he said. She gave him a queer look. You needn't pity me, she said. He went away considerably relieved in his mind, but still suffering that sullen uneasiness in his soul. Chapter 44 It was the last week in June. Mary Carteret sat in the door of the cottage by the beck and in her lap she held Essie's baby. Essie had run in to the last cottage in the row to look after her great-aunt, the Widow Gale, who had fallen out of bed in the night. The Widow Gale, in her solitude, had formed the habit of falling out of bed, but this time she had hurt her head, and Essie had gone for the doctor and had met Miss Mary in the village, and Mary had come with her to help. For by good luck, better luck than the Widow Gale deserved, it was a Wednesday, Rowcliffe had sent word that he would come at three. It was three now. And as he passed along the narrow path, he saw Mary Carteret in the doorway with the baby in her lap. She smiled at him as he went by. I'm making myself useful, she said. Oh, more than that. His impression was that Mary had made herself beautiful. He looked back over his shoulder and laughed as he hurried on. Up till now, it hadn't occurred to him that Mary could be beautiful. But it didn't puzzle him. He knew how she had achieved that momentary effect. He knew and he was to remember, for the effect repeated itself. As he came back, Mary was standing in the path, holding the baby in her arms. She was looking, she said, for Essie. Would Essie be coming soon? Rowcliffe did not answer all at once. He stood contemplating the picture. It wasn't all Mary. The baby did his part. He had been short-coated that month, and his thighs, crushed and delicately creased, showed rose-red against the white rose of Mary's arm. She leaned her head, brooding tenderly to his, and his head, he was a dark baby, was dusk to her flame. 
Rowcliffe smiled. Why, he said, do you want to get rid of him? As if unconsciously she pressed the child closer to her, as if unconsciously she held his head against her breast and when his fingers worked there in their way she covered them with her hand no she said he's a nice baby aren't you a nice baby there essie's unhappy because he's going to have blue eyes and dark hair but i think they're the prettiest don't you yes said rowcliffe he was grave and curt and mary remembered that that was what gwenda had blue eyes and dark hair it was what gwenda's children might have had too she felt that she had made him think of gwenda then essie came and took the baby from her he's too heavy for you miss she said she laughed as she took him she gazed at him with pride and affection unabashed his one fault for essie was that though he had got greatorex's eyes he had not got greatorex's hair mary and rowcliffe went back together you're coming in to tea aren't you she said rather he had got into the habit again of looking in at the vicarage for tea every wednesday they were having tea in the orchard now and in june the vicarage orchard was a pleasanter place than the surgery it was in fact a very pleasant place pleasanter than the grey and amber drawing-room when rowcliffe came to think of it he owed the carterets many pleasant things so he had formed another habit of asking them back to tea in his orchard he had had no idea what a pleasant place his orchard could be too now though rowcliffe nearly always had tea alone with mary at the vicarage mary never came to tea at rowcliffe's house alone she always brought alice with her and rowcliffe found that a nuisance for one thing alice had the air of being dragged there against her will so completely had she recovered from him for another he couldn't talk to mary quite so well he didn't know that he wanted to talk to mary he didn't know that he particularly wanted to be alone with her but somehow alice's being there made him want it he was to be alone with mary to-day in the orchard the window of the vicar's study raked the orchard but that didn't matter for the vicar was not at home this wednesday the orchard waited for them two wicker-work armchairs and the little round tea-table were set out under the trees mary's knitting lay in one of the chairs she had the habit of knitting while she talked or while rowcliffe talked and she listened the act of knitting disposed her to long silences it also occupied her so that rowcliffe when he liked could be silent too but generally he talked and mary listened they hadn't many subjects but mary made the most of what they had and she always knew the precise moment when rowcliffe had ceased to be interested in any one of them she knew as if by instinct all his moments they were talking now at tea-time about the widow gale mary wanted to know how the poor thing was getting on the widow gale had been rather badly shaken and she had bruised her poor old head in one hip but she wouldn't fall out of bed again to-night rowcliffe had barricaded the bed with a chest of drawers afterward there must be a rail or something mary was interested in the widow gale as long as rowcliffe liked to talk about her but the widow gale didn't carry them very far what would have carried them far was rowcliffe himself but rowcliffe never wanted to talk about himself to mary when mary tried to lead gently up to him rowcliffe shied he wouldn't talk about himself any more than he would talk about gwenda but mary didn't want to talk about gwenda either now so that her face showed the faintest flicker of dismay when rowcliffe suddenly began to talk about her have you any idea he said when your sister's coming back she won't be long said mary she's only gone to upthorne village i meant your other sister oh gwenda mary brooded and the impression her brooding made on rowcliffe was that mary knew something about gwenda she did not want to tell i don't think said mary gravely that gwenda ever will come back again at least not if she can help it i thought you knew that i suppose i must have known he left it there mary took up her knitting she was making a little vest for essie's baby rowcliffe watched it growing under her hands as i can't knit do you mind my smoking she didn't if more women knitted he said it would be a good thing they wouldn't be bothered so much with nerves i don't do it for nerves i haven't any said mary he laughed no i don't think you have she fell into one of her gentle silences a silence not of her own brooding he judged it had no dreams behind it and no imagination that carried her away a silence rather that brought her nearer to him that waited on his mood 
his eyes watched under half-closed lids the movements of her hands and the pretty droop of her head and he said to himself how sweet she is and how innocent and good their chairs were set near together in the small plot of grass the little trees of the orchard shut them in he began to notice things about her that he had not noticed before the shape and colour of her fingernails the modelling of her supple wrists the way her ears were curved and laid close to her rather broad head he saw that her skin was milk-white at the throat and honey-white at her ears and green-white the white of an elder flower at the roots of her red hair and as she unwound her ball of wool it rolled out of her lap and fell between her feet she stooped suddenly bringing under rowcliffe's eyes the nape of her neck shining with golden down and her shoulders sun-warmed and rosy under the thin muslin of her blouse they dived at the same moment and as their heads came up again their faces would have touched but that rowcliffe suddenly drew back his own i say i do beg your pardon it was odd but in the moment of his recoil from that imminent contact rowcliffe remembered the little red-haired nurse not that there was much resemblance for though the little nurse was sweet she was not altogether innocent neither was she what good people like mary carteret would call good and mary leaning back in her chair with the recovered ball in her lap was smiling at his confusion with an innocence and goodness of which he could have no doubt when he tried to account to himself for the remembrance he supposed it must have been the red hair that did it and up to the end and to the end of the end rowcliffe never knew that though he had been made subject to a sequence of relentless inhibitions and of suggestions overpowering in their nature and persistently sustained it was ultimately by aid of that one incongruous and irresistible association that mary carteret had cast her spell he had never really come under it until that moment july passed it was the end of august to the west carva and morfe high moor were purple to the east the bare hillsides with their limestone ramparts smouldered in mist and sun or shimmered burning like any hillside of the south the light even soaked into the grey walls of garth and its pastures the little plum trees in the vicarage orchard might have been olive trees twinkling in the sun mary was in the vicar's bedroom looking now at the door and now at her own image in the wardrobe glass it was seven o'clock in the evening and she had chosen a perilous moment for the glass she wore a childlike frock of rough green silk it had no collar but was cut square at the neck showing her white throat the square was bordered with an embroidered design of peacock's eyes the parted waves of her red hair were burnished with hard brushing its coils lay close and smooth as a thick round cap it needed neither comb nor any ornament mary had dressed for rowcliffe was coming to dinner such a thing had never been heard of at the vicarage but it had come to pass and as mary thought of how she had accomplished it she wondered what alice could possibly have meant when she said to her there are moments when i hate you as she hooked her up the back for it never could have happened if she had not persuaded the vicar and herself as well that she was asking rowcliffe on alice's account the vicar had come gradually to see that if alice must be married she had better marry rowcliffe and have done with it he had got used to rowcliffe and he rather liked him so he had only held out against the idea for a fortnight or so he had even found a certain austere satisfaction in the thought that he the doctor who had tried to terrify him about ally's insanity having thrown that bomb into the peaceful vicarage should be blown up as it were with his own explosion the vicar never doubted that it was ally that rowcliffe wanted for the idea of his wanting gwenda was so unpleasant to him that he had dismissed it as preposterous as for mary he had made up his mind that mary would never dream of marrying and leaving him and that if she did he would put his foot down there had been changes in the vicarage in the last two months the shabby grey and amber drawing-room was not all shabbiness and not all grey and amber now there were new cretonne covers on the chairs and sofa and pure white muslin curtains at the windows and the lamp had a new frilled petticoat every afternoon mrs gale was arrayed in a tight black gown and irreproachable cap and apron all day long mary and mrs gale had worked like galley slaves over the preparations for dinner and between them they had achieved perfection 
what was more they had produced an effect of achieving it every day clear soup mayonnaise salad and cheese straws and all and the black coffee made by mary and served in the orchard afterward was perfection too and the impression made on rowcliffe by the vicarage was that of a house and a household rehabilitated after a long period of devastation by the untiring selfless labour of a woman who was good and sweet after they had drunk mary's coffee the vicar strolled away to his study so as to leave rowcliffe alone with mary and alice strolled away heaven knew where so as to leave mary alone with rowcliffe and the vicar said to himself mary is really doing it very well ally ought to be grateful to her but ally wasn't a bit grateful she said to herself i've half a mind to tell him only gwenda would hate me and she called over her shoulder as she strolled away you'd better not stay out too long you two it's going to rain morf high moor hangs over garth and a hot and swollen cloud was hanging over morf high moor above the grey ramparts the very east was sultry in the orchard under the low plum trees it was as airless as in a tent rowcliffe didn't want to stay out too long in the orchard he knew that the window of the vicar's study raked it so he asked mary if she would come with him for a stroll his only criticism of mary was that she didn't walk enough mary thought my nice frock will be ruined if the rain comes but she went shall it be the moor or the fields he said mary thought again and said the fields he was glad she hadn't said the moor they strolled past the village and turned into the pasture that lay between the high road and the beck the narrow paths led up a slope from field to field through the gaps in the stone walls the fields turned with the turning of the dale and with that turning of the road that rowcliffe knew under carva instinctively with a hand on her arm he steered her away from the high road and its turning toward the back so that they had their backs to the thunderstorm as it came up over carva and the high moor it was when they were down in the bottom that it burst there was shelter on the further side of the last field they ran to it climbed and crouched together under the stone wall rowcliffe took off the light overcoat he wore and tried to put it on her but mary wouldn't let him she looked at his clothes at the round dinner jacket with its silk collar and at the beautiful evening trousers with their braided seams he insisted she refused he insisted still and compromised by laying the overcoat round both of them and they crouched together under the wall sitting closer so that the coat might cover them it thundered and lightened the rain pelted them from the high batteries of carva and rowcliffe drew mary closer she laughed like a happy child rowcliffe sighed it was after he had sighed that he kissed her under the cover of the coat they sat there for half an hour three quarters till the storm ceased with the rising of the moon i'm afraid the pretty frock's spoiled he said that doesn't matter your poor suit's ruined he laughed whatever's been ruined he said it was worth it hand in hand they went back together through the drenched fields at the first gap he stopped it's settled he said you won't go back on it you do care for me and you will marry me yes soon yes soon at the last gap he stopped again mary he said i suppose you knew about gwenda i knew there was something what was it he had said to himself i shall have to tell her i shall have to say i cared for her what he did say was there was nothing in it it's all over it was all over long ago i knew she said it was all over and the solemn white moon came up the moon that gwenda loved it came up over greffington edge and looked at them end of section fourteen recording by expatria in bangor maine